Good morning, everybody. Welcome from wherever you're joining and happy Friday. I should also say good afternoon because I am in Calgary. I know many of you are on the East Coast or in Ontario. If you have not met me, my name is Alison Mostwitz. I'm the Director of Engagement at Efficiency Canada. And Efficiency Canada operates within Carleton University. So we do acknowledge that the location of our campus sits on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. In doing so, we also acknowledge that we have a responsibility to the Algonquin people and a responsibility to adhere to Algonquin cultural protocol. So as per usual, I will just quickly note that we are here today for about 20 minutes for the presentation and then we'll have the question and answer after. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see the question and answer button there. Feel free to use that to submit questions throughout the presentation. And there is also an upvote function there. So if you like a question, the more likes the question gets, the better chance it will have of being asked. So with that, I would be very happy to introduce Sarah Dahl. So Sarah is the policy research associate working on our clean heat file. And she is here to talk today about more than just clean heat, but appliances and equipment standards. So with that, Sarah, I will hand it over to you and I will share my screen. Thanks, Allison. So today I'll be sharing the preliminary discussion of our latest report that will be released mid-February called Advancing Canadian Appliance and Equipment Standards. So I'll provide first some introduction and some background and of the appliance and equipment efficiency standards in Canada. So in 1992, the Energy Efficiency Act came into force, setting requirements and enforcement for energy efficiency regulations and labeling in Canada. The Act applies to energy using products that are imported into Canada or shipped between provinces. Canada's energy efficiency regulations, which are enabled by the Act, are what I'll be mostly discussing today rather than the Act itself. The regulations establish the minimum energy efficiency standards of energy using products, and that's to eliminate the least efficient products from the market. So in 2021, Enercan and the U.S. Department of Energy, or the DOE going forward, signed a memorandum of understanding concerning cooperation on energy. So that included collaborating on new and updated energy efficiency standards and test methods for energy utilizing consumer products and equipment. So as you'll see throughout my presentation today, this has had a notable impact on Canadian energy efficiency standards. So this is Enercan's regulatory process for amendments to the energy efficiency regulations. The regulations are amended pretty regularly. Amendment 17, which was the last amendment, came into force in 2023. And right now, Enercan has their forward regulatory plan for 2023 to 2025, which is a list of planned or anticipated changes to those regulations over those fiscal years. So Enercan held pre-consultation webinars for Amendment 18, which you'll see in red in June 2022, and then release the technical bulletins for each of the categories at July. Pre-publication of Amendment 18 in the Canada Gazette Part 1, which you'll see circled there, is expected this spring. It'll be followed by a public comment period, which is why we felt that this is a really opportune time for doing this research. Between pre-publication and the regulations coming into force is about a year and a half. So enforcement of Amendment 18 is expected from around mid to late 2025. So here is a list of product categories that uh, were part of the pre-consultation to Amendment 18. This is from Enercan's website. It's quite extensive. So the policy brief covers just a subset of the product categories that we felt were either the most interesting or would have the greatest impact. Also note that while most of the recommendations in the policy brief are for products that were covered by Amendment 18. The USDOE has recently proposed some new efficiency standards for cooking products. So we also look ahead to see what we'd like to talk about what we'd like to see in some future amendments. But I don't really touch on cooking products too much today, just for time. So for today's topics, the broad product categories that I'll be discussing today are major home appliances, lighting, water heating, and space and heating and cooling. For each category, I'll give some background, provide a comparison between current and proposed Canadian and international standards and energy star for many categories, and I'll discuss what efficiency standards or other regulations we'd like to see in Canada. So first, let's look at major home appliances. So some background. In December 2019, a mandate letter to the Minister of Natural Resources from the Prime Minister listed making Energy Star certification mandatory for all new home appliances starting in 2022. 
as a top priority. So this resulted in the pre-consultation for Amendment 17, proposing minimum energy performance standards, or MEPS, going forward for dishwashers, refrigerator freezers, clothes washers, and clothes dryers to align with the Energy Star performance levels from December 2019. So those regulations were intended to come into force July 1st of 2023. However, in response to some pushback from the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, or AHAM, Canada, and developments in the U.S. that were indicating some major revisions to their appliance efficiency standards with which Endercan intends to align. Major home appliances were removed from Amendment 17. And as you saw in a few slides back, major home appliances were also included in Amendment 18, which is ongoing. It was included in the pre-consultation. However, back in August, Endercan announced that Canada would be delaying updating those standards to align with the U.S., which at the time was slated for 2027 enforcement. In September, the U.S. Association of Ham, Home Appliance Manufacturers, or AHAM, and a group of efficiency advocates, which were led by the Appliance Standards Awareness Project, or ASAP, collaborated to produce a consensus set of recommended standards to the Department of Energy in the U.S. for major home appliances. And those recommendations generally align with the DOE's proposed standards. There's some differences, but those do spread out the compliance dates. So you'll see there's some categories that still use the DOE's proposed 2027 date, but some are spread as far out as January 2030 for some appliances and refrigerator freezers, so significantly later. So today for time, we'll just dig into three of the major home appliances, dishwashers, refrigerator freezers, and clothes dryers, but there's more categories in the policy brief. So first, we'll be discussing dishwashers. Here you can see the minimum energy performance standards for standard as well as compact size dishwashers in Canada, which has been in place since 2013, and compared to those required for Energy Star certification and what the U.S. Department of Energy has proposed in the U.S. from 2027, and that the joint recommendation from AHAM and ASAP recommends the same timelines as well. So the U.S. regulations and standards that are recommended are important for Canada since, like I mentioned in August, Enercan announced that they would be delaying strengthening dishwasher efficiency standards to align with those of the U.S., so you'll notice that Energy Star is listed twice. <laughs> That's not a mistake. Energy Star periodically strengthens their standards when the average efficiency on the market has significantly improved to ensure that meeting the Energy Star standard is still a meaningful improvement. So Energy Star actually increased the stringency for dishwasher certification in July, pretty impressively, especially when you look at compact dishwashers which is exciting. So Energy Star version 6 still included it here since that is what the Canadian stand minimum standard would have been right now if dishwashers hadn't been removed from Amendment 17. So it should be noted that the U.S. is proposing calculating energy consumption, assuming only 184 cycles or dishwasher cycles per year, rather than Canada and Energy Star use 215 cycles. So if you're kind of normalizing it for the different levels of dishwasher cycles in a year, Energy Star version 7 is more efficient across the board than the U.S.'s proposed standards. So next, let's look at refrigerator freezers. There, as I'm sure you know, there are many styles of refrigerator freezers as well as many different sizes. So just to have a equal playing field when looking at the comparisons, that these are all the requirements for a 400 liter refrigerator freezer with automatic defrost, top mounted freezer, and without through the door ice service. So just a, a pretty standard basic refrigerator freezer. First is Canada's current efficiency standard, which has been in effect since September 2014. And then you'll see the Energy Star standard, which has the same effective date and represents about a 10% improvement in efficiency over Canada's current standard. The last February, the US DOE proposed new energy efficiency standards for refrigerator freezers in the U.S. that would come into effect in 2027. And then, as mentioned before, in September, there were the AHAM and ASAP joint recommendations. So they have the, the recommend the same efficiency levels 
but they recommend a January 2030 compliance date for this style of refrigerator freezer. For, uh, for other styles, it is 2029, but in December, the US DOE announced the final direct rule. So a handmade app joint recommendation dates will stand in the US. And so it's quite a long timeline compared to the last effective date of Canadian regulations. So in plus getting appliances back on track report, they actually recommend the United for Efficiency model regulations, which have recommend a maximum level of 279 kilowatts per year. And for countries like Japan that have already achieved the standard, they recommend a next target of 223 kilowatt hours per year. So significantly lower than Canada and the US right now. So you can see other countries are showing extreme leadership on refrigerator, freezer, energy efficiency. The next is clothes dryers. Their efficiency is actually measured in pounds of clothing per kilowatt hour consumed. So unlike the other efficiency standards we've seen, the higher the number is actually the better. Canada's current efficiency standards have been in effect since 2015 for electric dryers. However, there's currently no efficiency standard for gas dryers in Canada. A minimum efficiency level was going to be introduced for gas dryers as part of Amendment 18. However, as part of the August announcement that we've discussed for aligning with the U.S. gas dryers, the efficiency will not actually be regulated until at least 2027 or 2028, depending on the final U.S. DOE ruling, which is expected in the next six months or so. So for the most part, the U.S. proposed efficiencies are the same or a modest increase on the energy or the energy star standards, with the exception of compact 120 volt electric dryers, which are gaining market share. So to summarize what Canadian leadership could look like for major home appliances, as we saw with all three products, the Energy Star standard consistently offers a modest improvement on Canada's current standards that were last updated between 2013 and 2015. It was a missed opportunity not following through on the 2019 commitment of making Energy Star efficiency mandatory for all major new home appliances, as it would be an excellent interim standard before harmonizing with the U.S.'s more stringent proposed standards at a later date. Energy Star appliances already capture a very large market share, and Energy Star level efficiency standards could achieve significant energy and consumer savings while acting as a stepping stone to U.S. standards harmonization between 2027 and 2030. So next, let's look to lighting, specifically general service lamps. So those are, that covers the majority of residential lighting. So lighting efficiency is measured in lumens per watt. Uh, lumen is the amount of light that's given off, while a watt is the amount of power consumed by the light bulb. So the higher the lumens per watt, the more efficient. So the higher number you see here, the better. Since 2014 in Canada, there have been different wattage requirements for different groups of lumen ranges, which is why you'll see the range there from 10.7 to 25.8, depending on how bright the bulb is. However, as part of Amendment 18, Enercan has proposed aligning with the U.S. current standard, which is 45 lumens per watt across the board. Canada is a signatory to the Minimata Convention on Mercury, which is requiring a ban on compact fluorescent lamps by 2025, as they do contain mercury. According to CLASP's Getting Appliances Back on Track report, enforcing technology neutral maps at 90 lumens per watt by 2025 is the easiest way for nations to simultaneously comply with the minimata and also ensure that there's no backsliding to incandescence or the most inefficient low quality LEDs in the market. So generally LEDs are very efficient and what we'd like to move towards, but there are some LEDs that are still low quality, unfortunately. So we'd like to move towards just the high efficiency one. So for countries that are already meeting the 90 lumens per watt efficiency standard, CLASP's report recommends a more ambitious 120 lumens per watt target. The UK is an excellent example of leadership in lighting efficiency. Their current standard is already 91 lumens per watt, and they've announced that they'd be increasing to 120 lumens per watt in late 2023 and 140 in 2027. Of course, we're already past late 2023. The regulation has been moved to this year, but when it does come into effect, it will be one of, if not the highest lighting efficiency standard in the world, which is very exciting. 
So looking at where Canada could lead, uh, a minimum efficiency of 90 lumens per watt uh, would really show leadership in lighting efficiency, and it would complement Canada's participation in the Metamatic Convention, since just banning fluorescence to remove mercury without increasing efficiency standards beyond the 45 lumens per watt could lead to backsliding to light bulbs that are less efficient than the fluorescence that they'd be replacing. And aligning with the UK's very impressive efficiency standards for lighting would show true leadership. And high efficiency lighting is a really cost effective way to free up electrical demand for other uses, which can be important in a net zero transition. Next, let's talk about water heaters. So the efficiency of hot water heaters is generally measured as a percentage or a uniform energy factor, except for the current standard in Canada for electric storage and hot water heaters, you'll see that is a maximum standby loss measured in watts. So it's a little bit tricky to compare that to the other uh, standards that are proposed or between different fuel sources. Canada's proposed efficiency standards are very similar to those of the US current standards for water heaters with the exception of the instantaneous, also known as the tankless gas types, which were not included in Amendment 18. Instantaneous or gas water heaters are very popular as they take up less space and are generally more efficient than the gas storage heaters, as you'll see in the table, since they don't need to maintain stored water temperatures. However, they're not without fault. They actually emit significantly more unburnt methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas, as their burners turn on and off every time hot water is used. And there have actually been some really exciting advancements to water heater technology in the past decade with the, the growth of heat pumps being used for hot water. And you'll see with the two red circles, that's how they're able to achieve greater than 100% efficiency for the Energy Star and the US DOE proposed uh, standard for electric storage that's only achievable with a heat pump. So it's very exciting that's becoming standard. And as fuel oil is the least efficient, and most greenhouse gas intensive way to heat water, you'll see that there's no Energy Star certification for oil water heaters. So in order for Canada to lead, we'd like to see Canada align with the US DOE's proposed standards for water heaters and to set a future date to adopt the more ambitious Energy Star efficiency levels as the standard. As oil water heaters are very inefficient, they produce significant greenhouse gases and fuel oil is the most expensive fuel source. We'd like to see Canada set a date when new oil water heaters could no longer be sold as well. Something that's really exciting is water heaters can act as thermal batteries, so they can play an important role in demand flexibility as water can be heated when it's least expensive in the case of time of use pricing or when there's an abundance of renewable energy and storage for use when the electricity is either more expensive or the grid is dirtier. So electric water heaters should be required to be manufactured with smart controls and sufficient insulation to allow for this demand flexibility. So next, let's talk about space heating and cooling. This is a, a very important category for Canada as space heating is the largest contributor to residential and commercial energy use in Canada. And space cooling is still a relatively small percentage of energy use, but it's of course a growing concern with increasing extreme weather events. Currently in Canada, Canada and the US are harmonized on residential air conditioner and heat pump efficiency since 2023. Canada has been a leader in furnace efficiency, which makes sense with our cold climate. Most styles of gas furnace sold in Canada must have at least a 95% fuel utilization efficiency. And that's been in effect since 2019, and the U.S. will actually be catching up to that standard in 2028, so significantly later than Canada. Currently, the Energy Star efficiency level for furnaces is 95%, so the, the same as the Canadian standard. But Energy Star has actually recently proposed sunsetting certification for residential furnaces and air conditioners, effective December 30th of this year. In the letter to stakeholders detailing the proposal, they state the need for the Energy Star label to serve as a market signal moving forward towards energy efficient heat pumps. Heat pumps are basically air conditioners that have the ability to also work in reverse to produce both efficient low carbon heating and cooling and can therefore replace both the furnace and air conditioner. Looking at provincial leadership on space heating and cooling in BC as part of the clean BC space and water heating must be a minimum of 100% efficient from 2030. And in Quebec, fuel oil furnaces and boilers can no longer be installed or replaced. 
as fuel oil is the most expensive, least efficient, and highest emission residential heating source. This is very exciting. So let's take a look at what Canadian leadership could look like. Every central air conditioner should be a heat pump. There's the Cool Way to Heat Homes report that was released last year that shows why installing heat pumps instead of central air conditioners in Canada is a no-brainer and everyone should check out that report. And extending the span on fuel oil furnace and boiler Canada-wide could result in significant utility savings and greenhouse gas reductions. The federal government could also follow British Columbia's lead by requiring a minimum efficiency of 100% for space and hot water heating in 2030. The 2030 timeline is important given the 15 to 20 year lifespan of furnaces and boilers in Canada and in Canada's net zero by 2050 commitment. So in conclusion, small improvements in appliance and equipment efficiency can result in very significant energy and greenhouse gas savings when aggregated over the more than 16.4 million homes and over half a million commercial and resident, commercial and industrial buildings in Canada. Yet small improvements are no longer enough. The often long timeframes between and the incremental progress of appliance and equipment standards updates do not capture how urgently we, uh, efficiency must be ramped up to realize our climate goals. Given the long life expectancy of major appliances and equipment, delays in strengthening efficiency standards lock in additional carbon emissions as well as higher consumer utility spending and as less efficient appliances cost more to run. Canada should maintain leadership in space heating and cooling. Finally, policymakers should consider how appliance and equipment regulations could be used to help solve other pressing energy-related challenges in a net zero transition. Demand flexibility will be essential to ensuring resource adequacy and reliability of tomorrow's electricity grid. Using appliance and equipment regulations to ensure the technical capacity exists to participate in load shifting or virtual power plants could help reduce electricity system costs and emissions. And a huge thank you to the Atmospheric Fund for funding this project. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Sarah. Okay, we do have some questions in the background, so let's get those. And I've got some questions as well. Just a reminder. Everybody, if you had any questions, please feel free to put them in the question and answer box. And again, you can upvote them. Okay, we're going to start from the top. There are some specific questions in here. So if you didn't come across anything in your research, it's not a big deal. And I'm just a reminder to everybody, this research continues. This is sort of an update on where we're at right now. Yeah, and so we'll just, we'll start with that. So Tracy asks, a lot of refrigerants still use hydrofluorocarbons. Is that being addressed anywhere in the energy standards, or is Efficiency Canada addressing moving to HTC-free refrigerants? What did you come across when you're looking at your research on that, Sarah? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's covered, if I'm not mistaken, more by Environment and Climate Change Canada rather than Natural Resources Canada. The Enercan research that I was looking at was more the minimum efficiency standards rather than regulating specific gases. But I do know that Canada also has commitments to phase down HFCs over time. Thank you. Do we expect this undertaking to have any impact on equipment and appliances designed for commercial applications? That's a great question. There are, in the policy brief, we did look at air conditioners and heat pumps that are designed for large commercial spaces as well, since those are also being updated in Amendment 18. Great. Thanks. So is it, does that apply to most commercial appliances when we're looking at that specific regulation? It's just this amendment that's only covering certain appliances? Uh, yes, there's, in this part of Amendment 18, there are like the, the large commercial air conditioners and heat pumps um, mm. that would that be used in commercial application. There's a lot of just uh, consumer appliances, but even in a commercial space, there might still be like a refrigerator or a break room. So there are some overlap there. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, have any provinces implemented different lighting efficiency standards? And what are the implications for mercury and efficiency? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now in Quebec and BC, they are already at the 45 lumens per watt standard that Canada will be, uh, the, all of Canada will be joining them in 2025. So that's very exciting that those provinces have been showing leadership there. Fantastic, thanks. Okay, so. With the assumption that efficiency is set at purchase date, is there a consideration of efficiency for the entire lifetime of an appliance? 
Yeah, that's a great question. In whenever the, the amendments are being proposed, I know that Enercan does do life cycle analysis of each of the recommendations to it, and they publish the net benefit over time in terms of both energy savings and additional manufacturing costs. In this report, we didn't specifically calculate those savings since they are quite complex, but that is published with each amendment. Okay, great. Um, so whoever asked that question can look out for that when the amendment's published. Okay, so this question comes from one of our allies who actually used to be, they used to work on the Energy Star certification levels in manufacturing. So the question is, they are adjusted to reflect the top end of the market. So if Canadian requirements line up with Energy Star, it, might, it may no longer represent the top end of the market. It defines the market. And she's just asking what you think about that and if you agree. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think something that is an important distinction for using Energy Star as the baseline is it's Energy Star from certain date in time. So for example, when Energy Star was going to be the standard from because of the, the 2019 mandate letter, it was going to be the Energy Star standard as it was in December 2019. So like we saw with, I think it was dishwashers, it was updated in July. So can't the Canadian standard would have stayed at what the previous level was. So as Energy Star becomes more stringent, Canada wouldn't necessarily have to adopt that more stringent levels. Like with the, the dishwashers, it's very stringent, the new Energy Star levels, which is amazing. You want to see the market going there, but it isn't realistic as necessarily a minimum standard for a country. Whereas the, the version six was much more achievable and there were just, it did represent the majority of the market, which is why they updated their standards. So it, it wouldn't require Canada to, by using the Energy Star, they wouldn't have to necessarily update every time it becomes more stringent to only capture the top end of the market. There's a choice there with the levels. The Energy Star just usually represents a nice, modest increase, as we saw with the, the three appliances that make it a great standard. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Chantal, if you want to talk with Sarah about that, I encourage you to reach out. We're happy to connect you. Okay, so th this is an interesting question. I think for me, it kind of makes me think about the methane emissions from the water heaters you're talking about. And this question is sort of more related to heat pumps. So what is the risk of refrigerant leakage from heat pumps? They're, you know, just stating that there could be significant emissions if, if there is a release there. Yeah, that's a great question. It really, the the risk of emissions of refrigerant really depends, like really good installation and maintenance are very important to minimize leakage. But I think it's also with the discussion of heat pumps, important to remember that uh, air conditioners have the same refrigerants and with heat pumps, the, the refrigerant load compared to an air conditioner would be about the same or maybe just slightly higher. So I think with refrigerants are used as a bit of a scapegoat sometimes conversation with heat pumps, whereas with air conditioners, they're the, the same refrigerants. And so just good management, good installation are really important. And there are regulations to lower the global warming potential of the refrigerants that are used in heat pumps. Um, but there is, of course, a trade-off in terms of cost. And also we want to get as many heat pumps out there as possible since they they do lower operational emissions significantly if that's not in the heat pump myth buster we published it should be it probably is but it <laughs> should be so. for sure <laughs> great okay the next question is can you address the electricity capacity for canada to run all the appliances yeah, that's a great point. So most of the appliances that I discuss are already electricity using appliances that you would have in Canada. So they shouldn't be adding any additional electrical demand, of course, for the heat pump. It will, there's a slight increase there, but what's really great about appliances is really inefficient appliances are wasting energy that we, by using more appliance, uh, more efficient appliances, you can free up electricity demand for better uses. So if all the bridges in Canada became significantly more efficient, then that could free up electricity demand to electrify home heating or add additional EVs to the grid with, without having spikes in additional demand. That was a great answer for something that is super, super complex. <laughs> And so this isn't a question that's been asked, but I think I just wanted to ask a question about the focus on the state. So tell me, why is it important that we're aligning a lot of these regulations with the state? 
Why not other countries? Why are we so focused on the states? Yeah, that's a great question. I I don't necessarily believe like whether we align with the U.S. or somebody with other countries. I think the U.S. and Canada have agreed to harmonize, and I do think mm. there's a lot of Canada is relatively small compared to the U.S. So there is the idea that we have a, a shared market for a lot of appliances. I think that is the reasoning behind harmonization. But with something like space heating. Canada on average is quite a bit colder than the U.S. And so our efficiency there matters so much more since Canadians are using so much more energy to heat their homes that it can also be great to look at European countries like Nordic countries that are equally as cold as Canada and have much more heat pumps or low carbon district heating compared to Canada. Uh, they're a great place to look for harmonizing or, or or just kind of looking at where the benchmarks are for mm. space heating. And I go into that a bit more in the policy brief. I just uh, didn't have time to, to chat about that as much today. Yeah, totally fair. And I think you had mentioned to me too, there is a lag between the harmonization and that can actually impact whether or not these emissions reductions get locked in because sometimes those appliances make their way to Canada. Yeah, did you want to expand on that a little bit? Oh, yeah. There's a chat with Enercan about this. There isn't any hard numbers, but just kind of with something with uh, light bulbs, for example, that we are a couple of years behind the US in updating the efficiency standards, that there's always a fear that the less efficient light bulbs could be potentially dumped in the Canadian market. But mm. we don't have numbers to back that up. That hasn't been researched, but it is a concern. Yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable. Okay, so somebody has a question about the um, 100% efficient proposal in BC. Does it include hybrid heating systems, for example? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's still a proposal at this point since the regulations would begin in 2030. But yes, it does include hybrid heating. So there are hybrid heat pumps. So they use electricity as the an electric heat pump as the main heating source. And then there's the, the gas backup that if they're properly designed, they are more than 100% efficient. So that would be included. Okay, great. Thank you. And then someone is curious if your research provided any indication of what fraction of appliances in the marketplace are not Energy Star rated right now. Did you get any indication of that? That's a great question. I did not kind of aggregate it, but that's something now that you mentioned it, that would be really interesting and something I'd like mm -hmm. to look at. Awesome. We love ideas here. So yeah, if anyone mm -hmm. has any ideas, feel free to suggest them. Okay. So the U.S. is moving towards condensing gas water heater which is expected to be in effect by 2029. Is Canada going to follow that? Have you seen any indication? That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head, but Canada and the U.S. are relatively aligned on water heating. So I'd have to take another look at that. It's not something I know off the top of my head, but Canada and the U.S. are aligned, are aligning or are aligned on most categories. Okay, great. Thanks. There's a couple questions in here about cold climate heat pumps and just and their effectiveness so there's maybe i'll just ask this one question wondering sort of where that information could be so is there a collation of information on cold weather heat pumps that we've compiled and just saying sort of like many municipalities cite that it's too cold to use heat pumps which is very time consuming to find information and collate it and yeah we have definitely heard that before so did you want to address that sarah yeah, I don't know if there's like a, a single source for all of the data, but we do, of course, have our MythBuster that does discuss heat pumps in cold climates, and they're the the newest the newest cold climate heat pumps have been tested to work to around negative thirty, but even a less technologically advanced cold climate heat pump can still heat to negative twenty. I think in Canada we talk about the wind chill a lot, so I think we feel that it gets to a lot colder than it does in most Canadian cities because of the wind chill effect, but it really is just the true air temperature that's important for heat pumps rather than how it would feel that the, the wind chill is for how it feels on human skin. So I think that's important, but also there are electric backup strips that can supplement the heat of the heat pump and until it gets to really any temperature you see in Canada. So, and heat pumps are incredibly efficient. So I don't think that like the concerns about heat pumps getting by working in, in cold temperatures 
are in most situations in Canada should detract from them. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So I just posted the link to the heat pump. Well, we've got a, a number of resources. There's a blog, there's the actual report. So yeah, if anybody's interested, that, that uh, link is now in the chat. So go ahead and grab it. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting question. Just wondering, and it's more about the sort of like circular economy of all of these appliances. So what happens if all of the appliances get re replaced with Energy Star ones? Lots of waste. So have you looked at that or is that something that we would look at all? Yeah, that's a great question. It's not something I've thought about too much, but I would say that any of these regulations that there, nobody is coming to take away <laughs> your less efficient re refrigerator. If there, if anything that's already existing in your home wouldn't be banned, it's more just when there it's time for replacement, you wouldn't be able to buy a less efficient one, which is why it's really important to have these regulations soon so that if your refrigerator breaks tomorrow that there'll be more efficient ones will be the the minimum standard but recycling is very important it's not something i've looked into but most appliances have some metal which is recyclable there's a, a recycling market for metals but you no know, it's definitely the circular economy is something i'm very interested in it just wasn't really in the scope for this project that's great thanks so much sarah Okay, so is there a concern about the need to increase the batteries for the UPS so our tech is available during inevitable power outages and the environmental impact from battery disposal? So again, it's, it's a bit of a circular economy question, but also I think the storage question that you were talking about before. Yeah, that's something that's very exciting with water heaters is that they can act as a thermal battery. So there are some air to water heat pumps on the market that can also, like there's one called Harvest Thermal, that can work to heat your home and hot water and works as a thermal battery. So if you were experiencing a power outage, you could draw from that heat that had been stored up. And of course, battery storage will become a definitely more important as you move to more renewables on the market. All I've heard about the kind of the battery recycling is from EVs. And I've heard that there's actually quite an impressive recycling going on because there are so many important rare minerals and that are a part of it that the recycling, what I've read is quite efficient, but it's not something I am definitely not an expert on. Today is the day our scope expands to increase <laughs> the economy. Okay. So we have time for about one more question, and I just wanted to circle back on the reason that we're doing this research and also some of the opportunities for people to participate. So as they're working through sort of the regulatory process with Amendment 18, where are people going to have an opportunity to have a say and how do they go about doing that? I know there was a slide, but I guess talk about why this is important too. Yeah, definitely. I think that appliances are not necessarily something that most people think about day to day. It's not in, I'd say the appliance efficiency is not something that's in the news as much as for the most part, other than maybe heat pumps, but that they are in everybody's homes, everyone's businesses. There are so many appliances in Canada that just even small improvements can have a massive impact when it's aggregated. So they're very important since they can have a really large impact and can create a lot of electricity for better uses. Right now is Amendment 18, so it will be the pre-publication in the Canada Gazette Part 1, which is the government sort of newspaper, it will be coming out in spring. So there'll be a 70-day comment period after then, after it's released, that you can submit comments. So that's definitely something that we'll be participating in. And there should be more details on that Manor Cans website for other people or organizations that are interested in commenting. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sarah. So you might have mentioned that Sarah was talking about the brief. We are expecting the brief to be released soon. We don't have an exact date yet, but we wanted to do this webinar just to kind of make people aware that this is happening, that there is an amendment on the horizon and that there will be a consultation period and that this is important. So if you care about emissions, it is something you keep an eye out for. How do you keep an eye out for it? If you want notification of this publication and pretty much of all of our other publications and other great news and energy efficiency, 
the best way to do it is to sign up for our newsletter. That is where we publish pretty much everything we've done and anything we see that's important in this, this energy efficiency ecosystem. So you can find our newsletter just on the main page of our website. I encourage you to sign up. And so with that, we are going to leave it for the day. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming today. That was a ton of information. If anybody would find the slides useful and are interested in participating in this, please reach out to us. We can share those slides in PDF format because it was, you know, there's some tables, there's some data in there for sure. And Sarah's done an amazing job collating it, which will also be in the brief, but we're happy to share the slides. So, and you can also catch this webinar. We've recorded it. You can catch it on YouTube in probably about a week's time, I would say. Last message for the day is we hope you join us again in two weeks. Two weeks from now, we're going to have Kai Miller join us, who is going to talk about the Greener Homes retrofit what's happening, what should happen, should we ramp it up, should it fade away? So we encourage you to join us on February 9th for that. And once again, thank you, Sarah, so much. We really appreciate you being here and thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much. Okay, take care everyone. Happy Friday. Bye.